tonight on All In. It should be the entire nation who determines who they want for president, whether they're guilty of insurrection or not. Donald Trump asked the Supreme Court to save him from getting kicked off the ballot. Plus, are you better off than you were four years ago? The Republican frontrunner, convicted of fraud, has a new sleight of hand. Were you better off five years ago? Were you better off five years ago? Were you better off five years ago? Or are you better off today? Tonight, Speaker Emerita Nancy Pelosi on America's Choice in 2024, and former Obama campaign manager David Plouffe on whether liberals in open primary should vote Nikki Haley to stop Donald Trump. But All In starts right now. Good evening from New York. I'm Chris Hayes, and Happy New Year. It's good to be back here with all of you. Thanks to the folks that filled in. I really appreciate it. We are now officially at the beginning of an election year that promises to be a very wild ride. The first in the nation, uh, Iowa Republican Caucus, is less than two weeks away. That's the first votes that will be cast. As Politico reports, Donald Trump's campaign for capital endorsements is accelerating, leading up to that deadline, and predictably, Republicans are falling in line. Today, you've got the number three House Republican, Tom Emmer of Minnesota, the one whose speakership bid was single-handedly destroyed by Donald Trump, announcing his endorsement of Trump's third bid for the White House. Senator Tom Cotton of Arkansas filed suit with a statement that I think perfectly articulates the insane false history that Trump and his party are going to tell to try to win this election. Here it is. Senator Cotton said in part, quote, when Donald Trump was president, America was safe, strong, and prosperous. The economy was booming. Working class wages were growing. Our border was secure, and our enemies feared us. With Joe Biden as president, everything has gone to hell. Families can't afford groceries. Our border is wide open to a full-blown invasion. And our enemies are starting wars everywhere. Of course, we also heard Donald Trump making those kinds of outlandish claims himself. Everything was perfect when he was president. Everything has been awful under Joe Biden. But recently, while repeating the argument at a campaign rally in New Hampshire, Trump revealed a really amazing tell. Were you better off five years ago or are you better off today? No contest. There's no contest. Nobody would say, nobody would say today. What a difference a president can make. It really does make a difference, a big difference. Son, you notice what he said? Five years. Are you better off than you were five years ago? Now, he's obviously referencing the iconic line from Ronald Reagan that helped him clinch the presidency in 1990. Are you better off than you were four years ago? Is it easier for you to go and buy things in the stores than it was four years ago? Is there more or less unemployment in the country than there was four years ago? Is America as respected throughout the world as it was? Do you feel that our security is as safe, that we're as strong as we were four years ago? And if you answer all of those questions, yes, why then I think your choice is very obvious as to who you'll vote for. Candidates have been using the are you better off line ever since. And so here comes Donald Trump. And somehow it's five years instead of four. And there's a very obvious reason for that. Because four years ago, let's see if we can do the math, it was 2020. You remember 2020? You and I were both here. We were in the midst of the worst pandemic in 100 years. Thousands of Americans were dying every day. Hospitals were overflowing. Morgues were overwhelmed. The dead bodies were being piled up in refrigerated trucks they had to bring in. We had mass graves being dug in New York City. And the president was suggesting that people treat the deadly virus by injecting bleach or shining UV light inside their body or taking a horse to worm. Tens of millions of people lost their jobs. The worst unemployment rate since the Great Depression. Across the country, millions of people turned to food banks waiting in miles-long lines like this one. There was a genuine, palpable, ever-present sense of chaos and social unraveling throughout America, throughout its towns and cities. Do you remember that in that year, 2020, the murder rate rose nearly 30% in one year, a completely unprecedented spike in violence? So just in terms of these objective metrics, a lot of things were going haywire in this country four years ago while Donald Trump was president. So let's look at what things are four years later under President Joe Biden. 
Thankfully, the worst of the pandemic is over. Even a spike in cases, as there are right around now, actually, this time of year, does not result in mass graves and morgues overflowing, in large part thanks to mass vaccination. On the economy, the country's having an incredible economic recovery, in some ways maybe the best it's ever seen. The unemployment rate has dropped below 4% and stayed there for the longest streak in literally 50 years. Job creation has exploded as the White House touts in that chart. Look at that. That's the over the course of the presidency. The U.S. economy just added another 200,000 jobs in November. Manufacturing spending and investment is off the charts almost literally. You can see here, right? Look what happens. Yet another promise Donald Trump failed to follow through on during his time in office. Basically, every major economic indicator is up under President Joe Biden. Not to mention fuel is now less than it was in 2022. There is one exception. Consumer confidence. The thing about consumer attitudes in the economy is that there is a massive partisan lens to it. Take a look at this incredible recent example. So nearly 30% of Republicans who made more money in 2022 than they did in 2020, meaning their, their income increased, said their income had actually decreased. And that's true of even those who made over $40,000 more. They're making $40,000 more and they're telling pollsters they're making less money. They refuse to accept the economy is doing better. In fact, they are in such denial, they are misreporting their own personal finances. And it's not just the economy. And I think this is actually crucial. Since Biden took office, that pervasive sense of social deterioration that came with the pandemic is also showing real signs of healing. Remember, Trump used this as a campaign argument, claiming his opponent could not keep the country safe. And rights won't be safe in Joe Biden's America. In Joe Biden's America, we'll all be in danger. safe in Joe Biden's America. First of all, what was amazing about that ad he was running it in 2020 is that he was showing pictures of Donald Trump's America. Donald Trump was president when that stuff was happening. He was the incumbent, right? So here we are four years later. We do not have widespread chaos in the streets in America. In fact, after spiking under Trump at a nearly unprecedented rate, the country is on track to see a record drop in homicides for 2023. Yes, you heard me right. Crime spiked up during Donald Trump, and it's dropping now under Joe Biden, the most serious crime, homicide. Now, America is a big, unruly, and complicated country with many, many social ills, many of them tragic and persistent. It has always been a tragic and inspiring nation in equal parts. But we are on an upward trajectory. There is reason to believe it will keep getting better, and that is why Joe Biden and the White House should welcome the Tom Cotton story about Donald Trump's America versus Joe Biden's. They should embrace that argument head on. Talk about what America was really like four years ago. Four years ago. Because the answer whether you were better off in 2020 under Donald Trump than you are now as we kick off 2024 is plain as day. Joining me now is Speaker Emerita Nancy Pelosi. She is Democrat of California. It's great to have you on the program. I I'm curious how you think about um, the message about th this president and incumbency particular on that sort of central question mm -hmm. that is always at the core of a re-election campaign for, for, for any incumbent, particularly an incumbent president, of the are you better off, have things gotten better? Well, thank you for your presentation of the facts of, of our economy. Congratulations on your show. And I'm honored to be once again on your first. I was on the first when you started, and now the first for this year, this election year. I always see things from the kitchen table. And at the kitchen table, we see, as you mentioned, wages are up, unemployment is down. What is also so is inflation is, is diminishing, even though it's a, na a global phenomenon and we compare well to other countries. But I also see the cost of, of course, affordable care, ha uh, health care. When you talk about four years ago and you see that the president at that time was uh, in denial, in delay, people lost their lives. He was fighting the Affordable Care Act. He said he was going to reply, uh, repeal and replace. He never came up with a plan. Now he says Obamacare sucks. 
Well, the <laughs> fact is, it is very high in public in public mind. And if you're at that kitchen table, the cost of health care is not only a health issue, it's a financial health issue as well. And related to health is a woman's right to choose, because that's an economic issue if and when you would have uh, a larger family. Uh, in terms of uh, LGBTQ and everything, democracy and a fair economy are personal issues, are personal issues. So we have to be—have clarity in how we put out these facts, and I appreciate what you did say. Also, the stock market is up. And when it was up, when uh, what's-his-name was president, he bragged about it. Women love me because their husband's 401k is blah, 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 and all that. The uh, economy—the uh, stock market is higher than it was when he was president. So let's just take it to the kitchen table about people's health, financial well-being their freedom to live their lives, and, again, the opportunity that Joe Biden has given them with unemployment, 15 million new jobs created. And as you said, some in the manufacturing sector, productivity up. This has been is a remarkable story, and in a short period of time, most of that was done in the first two years with the Democratic Congress, says she immodestly, House and Senate. <laughs> with Joe Biden as our inspiration. You know, one of the great ironies I want to ask you about, because we have this comparison, right, four years. We're now in 2024. So, you know, mm -hmm. are you better off four years? One of the great ironies, I think, uh, about 2020, when you look back, is the CARES Act, which was, in some ways, a remarkable piece of legislation. And largely, I have to mm -hmm. say, the work of you <laughs> and Steve Mnuchin Basically, I mean, it was it was a sort of it was the House leadership under your stewardship and the White House sort of tasking Mnuchin. And one of the great ironies is that that legislation, which really reflected the Democratic priorities of the House, ends up sort of yeah. being a thing that I think Donald Trump tried to hang his hat on. Right. So there's this sort of great irony that a lot of what was done to kind of help the country in this moment of peril really embodied the priorities of your Democratic Party and was used by Donald Trump in that election year, I suspect will again, as fodder for why he should get credit. Well, in addition to the CARES Act, we had some follow-ups to it. And I want to commend Maxine Waters and Nydia Velasquez in how businesses participated, yep. how diversity was represented, and how the money was spent. And Maxine, if you could have heard Maxine and Nydia on the phone with Mnuchin, it was something historic <laughs> in terms of putting it out there. And also, in terms of how the uh, funds were distributed, the opportunity for uh, access to, uh, to whatever, whether it was a would become one day a vaccine, but uh, the, the, the measure of how this was affecting our community. Uh, so, again, it was the CARES Act plus, plus, mm -hmm. plus, plus. And uh, it, it, it was bipartisan and made a difference. But there was much more we needed to do that we couldn't do until President Biden well, took office and we had the rescue package, which really wrapped it up and drove it home in terms of uh, meeting the needs of cities and counties and, and state governments and the, the people who make our society work, whether it's transportation or health care, teachers or food uh, services, the list, the list goes on. Yeah, that, that American Rescue, uh, the ARP, and then the subsequent legislation, the Inflation Reduction Act. I mean, again, this is like in the most basic sense of, of, of messaging. You can almost, on a graph, the Inflation Act Reduction Act is basically passed at the moment of highest inflation. Now, do I think that causally it is the case that the Inflation Reduction Act, which mm -hmm. sort of was cheekily named in certain ways to get Joe Manchin on board, was what caused the reduction in inflation? No. But again, the way this works is presidents take credit. And it is the fact that the Democratic members of Congress and the president signed legislation called the Inflation Reduction Act. And if you look at the graph of inflation afterwards, it literally goes straight down. It does. And, it, and also, there was deficit reduction, uh, um, the reduction of the, for the national debt in the legislation. I remind that the rescue package, which was helped to create so many jobs and, again, support our state and local governments, many of 
whose jobs are yep. union jobs, and many of which were women and minority union jobs. That's really important. And there's also in the um, Inflation Reduction Act, not one Republican vote. Not one in the rescue package, and not one in the uh, in the IRA. And in the IRA, if you talked about some aspects of it, and of course, it was the, the biggest bill to uh, law to help us fight the climate crisis. But also in the bill was the reduction of the cost. Of the, for the first time, we were able to have the negotiation by the secretary of HHS to negotiate for lower. Price prescription drugs for seniors, and in the bill itself, it reduced the cost of of um, of Medicare for people with uh, diabetes and yep. the rest from six hundred dollars a month or five hundred dollars a month, depending, to thirty five dollars a month. The Republicans have said they're going to overturn that. Uh, the pharmaceutical companies are taking it to court. Wait a minute. Let's get back to that kitchen table. Let's get back to that kitchen table. The cost of medicines and pharmaceuticals is very important in the bottom line of America's work, working families. Having access to the Affordable Care Act, very important. So, uh, again, there are aspects of these bills that have directly hit home for America's families. And you know why? Joe Biden insisted upon it. We had been advocating these things for a long time and not having success with it. But he was making it a priority as part of his vision, his knowledge of, of legislation and what has worked in the past mm -hmm. and not his strategic thinking about how to legislate. And, this, and that's all up here. And then in his heart, his love for the American people. He cares. And the empathy that he had for that kitchen table, the upbringing, the upbringing that he had, his understanding of America's working families. So when we talk about this, we have to be trying to embrace everyone to make sure we're not fighting old fights. What we're doing is making life better for them. And that means ACA. When we won in 2018, people said, weren't you lucky that the affordable, that health care was such an important issue in the campaign? I said, no, we weren't lucky. We made our own luck. Right. We had 10,000 events to protect the Affordable Care Act from what the, uh, the Trump administration and the Republicans were trying to do. Why? Because they were representing the big corporate America in all of this and their anti-governance approach to how we meet the needs of the American people. So I'm very excited about, as Joe Biden goes at, President Biden goes out on the campaign trail, he can make the case very well, because he knows firsthand, because when, sometimes when I say to him, we have to, we have to get this or this or that, he said, Nancy, I campaigned on that. Hmm. I wrote the bill. I'm all I'm there with you, and in some respects he did. Well, uh, so again, it's a it's pretty you, exciting you, to you see this chance now when people are paying attention for them to see the difference that he has made. You two have worked together for 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 a little bit, Speaker Emerita Nancy Pelosi of California. Yeah. Thank you very much for your time tonight. Thank you, my pleasure. Congratulations to you on another year. Thank you very Happy much. Happy New Year to everyone. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Coming up, as Donald Trump begs the Supreme Court to keep him on the ballot, what Trump is arguing and the next steps for the court after this. Just a few hours ago, Donald Trump appealed to the United States Supreme Court to overturn Colorado's ruling to kick him off that state's primary ballot. The ex-president starts off his appeal by arguing that it is a fundamental principle of our representative democracy embodied in the Constitution that the people should choose whom they please to govern them. Although that seems to suggest voters should decide without restriction, ignoring all the restrictions on presidential candidates in the Constitution, including they at least be 35 years old, born in the U.S., and, according to Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, not engaged in insurrection against the very country they took an oath to defend. Now, Trump argues that he is not subject to the Section 3 of the 14th Amendment because the president is not an officer of the United States. He also claims that Section 3 applies only to those who took an oath to support the Constitution of the United States, such as U.S. senators and representatives, but that the president swears a different oath in which he promises to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution, and in which the word support is nowhere to be found. 
Harry Lippman is a former U.S. attorney for the Western District of Pennsylvania. He also served as Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Department of Justice, and he joins me now. Um, Harry, we knew this cert petition to try to get the Supreme Court to step in was coming. What do you think of the actual arguments presented in the brief? You know, the more you read them, there there are all the obvious ones, Chris, and then some. So he's thrown what, what you just said about the officer. He said certain things about why Congress has to do it. He's even trotted out a good old Bush versus Gore argument where they try to federalize state law because there's some mention of state electors in the Constitution, a bunch of state law claims. It's a competent and comprehensive petition. So we knew this was going to come. We also know that this is a this is a sort of interesting, complicated area of the law insofar as um, we just haven't had this specific problem before. <laughs> a guy running for president who engaged in insurrection and supported it. Um, the, the, it seems inevitable the Supreme Court is going to take this on. What are the next steps here in terms of what the court does and also what the timeline might look like? All right. So first, that is a massive understatement. We are so far off road and all and as are all the possible things they could do. I wouldn't discount the possibility in a case like this that they're acutely aware of how a decision like this could royal the country and harm their own diminishing capital, and they might well be casting around for a least offensive solution. In terms of timing, their next conference is Friday. They could take it on Friday. Normally, they would announce that Monday, but they could announce it in cases like this on Friday and give for them a warp speed schedule of, say, about five weeks or so to do all three briefs and to hear the case shortly thereafter, probably in the March sitting. Hmm. But we ha there's this really rich problem here because the Constitution has an amalgam of power between state and federal governments for picking presidents. But we all know that, as a cultural fact, the election is a national one. And all the things that they're, I think the court will be very much inclined to try to have a uniform so national solution, keep from a patchwork approach. And yet they have very few options and none of them is really pristine for making one national rule. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. So so you've got I mean, you've got this weird time limit, too, right, because it's it's only right. it's, it's only sort of paused from going into effect by the Colorado State Supreme Court, which basically says, look, we anticipate SCOTUS will have something to say about this. We'll pause the th this going into effect to give them a little time. I don't know. I forget when that is. I think it's in a week or so. But they've got to do and, it's, but, they got to do something, they, right? Right. And Trump mentions Maine has gone ahead. There are 17 things out there. The court will have paramount in mind that they can't choose a solution that just does it for Colorado. For instance, uh, they, they could try to say it, they didn't decide insurrection right. But then another state could say, thank you. We're deciding it. He's off our ballot. Right. The, the basic main argument is political question. We saw this in gerrymandering cases. There aren't judicially manageable standards. Guess what? That's a federal doctrine that doesn't constrain. Oh, no, yeah, that doesn't help. Yeah, it, it really doesn't. The easiest thing for them to do, it's a tortured argument, however, would be to pick up on the point you made at the top that somehow the text itself excludes yep. him as an officer or else somehow dictates that Congress has to be the one to decide. These are not clean arguments. I think the framers wouldn't have been too upset at having different solutions. And that's how we get here. It's not really a matter of constitutional ironclad law, but it's a matter of we cannot have in 2024 an election with these different patchwork yeah. solutions. And I think They're the court will be doing everything they can to prevent it. They're going to step in. They're stepping quickly. I think the, you will yep. get something uniform. My fearless forecaster says that I, I think 6-3 quickly decided 6-3 that he's not an officer because it's just sort of the easiest thing to do, uh, whether, whether it's textualist or yeah. not. And very quickly, I think in situations like this, they may be looking for the easiest. It's not so political. And they don't want that 6-3 to three if the 3 is nasty, Alito yeah. and Thomas castigating the court. This is a really, really tight corner the court is in. All right, Harry Lippman, thank you very much. Thanks, Still to Chris. come, the special counsel brings up some awfully incendiary hypotheticals in a recent court filing. What Jack Smith means when he talks about a president who sells nuclear secrets to a foreign adversary. Ahead.
So Donald Trump is still trying to get his federal criminal election interference case thrown out of court. His lawyers are attempting to get special counsel Jack Smith's charges dismissed before there's even a trial by using an exceptionally broad definition of presidential immunity. Now, Smith's prosecutors naturally disagree, and the case finds itself in front of the three-member three D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, a sub-panel, with some of the most important oral arguments in our nation's history set to begin next Tuesday, less than one week from today. And as lawyers for both sides ready those arguments, the appeals court added a new wrinkle in a one-sentence legal filing yesterday. Quote, it is ordered that counsel be prepared to address at oral arguments any inquiries by the court regarding discrete issues raised in the briefs filed by amicus curiae. In other words, be prepared to discuss any amicus briefs related to this case. Those are outside arguments submitted by so-called friends of the court. Now, there have been a few amicus briefs filed in this case, as there are in many high-profile legal battles. But one in particular is getting a lot of attention this week. Late last month, the watchdog group American Oversight filed a brief effectively arguing that Trump should not even be able to appeal the decision on immunity from Judge Chutkin at all until after it goes to trial. Quote, given that Trump has not been convicted or sentenced, his appeal is premature. The D.C. Circuit lacks appellate jurisdiction and should dismiss the appeal and return the case to district court for trial promptly. Now, I'll spare you the specific and technical legal arguments behind this. Suffice it to say, it has been turning some heads in legal circles. And it now appears the Court of Appeals may be opening to hearing arguments to that argument, to that validity as well. If the judges are receptive to that argument, it would be a kind of elegant way to ensure that Donald Trump still sees his day in court before the election while still leaving the door open for him to appeal on immunity grounds after a potential conviction. That's when the bulk of appeals happen in criminal cases. Now, it's worth reiterating that the immunity grounds that Trump is basing his appeal on are remarkably broad. He is essentially saying the president should be able to operate with near impunity, installing himself as a dictator who's completely unaccountable to the American criminal legal system. I want to talk about the immunity question, this latest development from the Court of Appeals with two of my favorite legal minds right here on set. Don't go anywhere. Donald Trump's desire for unchecked power is completely incompatible with the structure of the U.S. Constitution, yet he's gotten his lawyers to channel him in making an exceptionally broad argument of presidential immunity in order to get special counsel Jack Smith's election interference criminal charges against him thrown out. In a new filing, Smith's prosecutors call Trump's argument of effective impunity for presidents, quote, sobering. They cite a few unusually specific hypotheticals to point out just how dangerous that view of presidential immunity could be for the country. Quote, that approach would grant immunity from criminal prosecution to a president who accepts a bribe in exchange for directing a lucrative government contract to the payer, a president who instructs the FBI director to plant incriminating evidence on a political enemy, a president who orders the National Guard to murder his most prominent critics, or a president who sells nuclear secrets to a foreign adversary. Timmy Dio Agonga Williams, a former federal prosecutor who served as senior investigative counsel for the January 6th committee. Donya Perry is the former chief of the criminal division for the Southern District, New York, served as deputy New York State Attorney General, and they both join me now. Timmy Dio, let me start with you on the. Uh, they have used these examples before, and the, and the Trump breach is, is, is very uh, 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 frustrated or angry about it. They, they say that the, the brief ignores the actual lessons from history and provides a list of lurid hypotheticals that have never happened, including treason and murder. What is the point that Smith is making here? I think it emphasizes how broad Trump's argument is, and that's what he wants the court to understand. If the court is to go with Trump here, what that means is that not only is the president uh, have immunity, but the president can engage in this kind of wide-ranging, you know, conduct here. And the president, whether it be President Biden or any future president, would have no—the uh, American people would have no recourse against punishing that president. So I think while these are perhaps somewhat extreme examples, we should remember we are dealing, in fact, in reality, with an insurrection. So it's not that extreme. You have a president who led a violent mob to attack the Capitol. The idea that that same conduct or that kind of president could also sell nuclear secrets or otherwise engage in violence, we've seen a president effectively engage in violence against the U.S. So I think they're appropriate examples, and I think the court— will take notice of it. Well, I also—it was funny to me, Donnie, to see that the—in the, the in reply, Trump's lawyer is saying that they—that it was—that 
that, that th these are things that have never happened. It's like, well, yeah, January 6th never happened until it happened. Yeah. Everything here is out, out past the frontier of the known. Right. I mean, the, a lot of their argument is there's no precedent for you, you're not going to find anywhere in in the law books any any precedent for the use of president uh, presidential immunity. Well, of course not. Right. It's never happened before. So they go back to Marbury versus Madison in 1803 Supreme Court case. They pick out little snippets, you know, from the Federalist Papers. There is nothing simply because no one's ever done anything like this right. before. So there's an absence of, of case law and precedent for this. Um, but the fact is the, the, the former president is subject to the same laws as everybody else. The, they, they say nothing new in these uh, court of Appeals papers, there's nothing new to be said. And I'm, I'm quite certain that when this goes to the Supreme Court, if this goes to the Supreme Court, they're not going to have anything new to say either. Well, we're going to get oral arguments in this case next week in front of that three-judge panel. I mean, it, it strikes me, too, that the, the sort of argument specifically that Trump's lawyers are making is that this is at the outer perimeter of his official duties, right? So that there's this, if there's any interface at all with a thing that could plausibly be called your official duties, in this case, protecting the election integrity of the U.S., then you're immune, right? And so Smith, in, in these examples, is saying, like, OK, like, these are things that you you would be in the catchment area <laughs> of things that you're saying are immune if we took seriously your argument. Exactly. And what Smith does well is that he he points out how Trump's legal team is basically zooming out. And if you zoom right, out from right. any legal conduct, it sounds pretty normal. Right. So you may be contacting state officials and trying to help, you know, get them to conspire with you to overturn an election. But if you zoom out, oh, it's just a president talking to state I'm officials. I'm just talking to someone. Yes, exactly. exactly. This has been the consistent defense. Exactly. And what Smith asked the court to do is that, no, look at what we're actually talking about. Look at the facts. So whether it be selling new Click secrets, whether it be conspiring to overturn an election, look at the actual facts and then and then uh, understand whether if you were to grant immunity, what does that mean for those facts? So I want to just talk about that American oversight brief I mentioned in the previous block, um, which is an amicus. And, and, and the only reason I think this has gotten people's attention is the order mm -hmm. in which the, the judges say, hey, I'm ready to talk about some stuff that might be in the amicus. So here's the, the argument from the, that brief. The court should dismiss this appeal for lack of jurisdiction under controlling Supreme Court precedent An interlocutory order, which is what they're seeking, right? Denying immunity in criminal case is not immediately appealable unless the claimed immunity rests upon an explicit statutory or constitutional guarantee that the trial will not occur. What do you think of the argument? It looks strong. Uh, there are very few such uh, immunity guarantees. We know of, of two, I believe, the speech or debate clause and double jeopardy. Right. Those are two that are enumerated. There are others that courts have said do not exist. So other types of immunity that have been shot down by the courts. Presidential immunity, of course, has never been tested in the courts. Right. So, so he's saying that. because these aren't in the category that are already established by the Constitution or explicitly granted, you don't get this thing called an interlocutory appeal. Usually, right, the way this all works is, and you'll see this after people get convicted, they come outside in the steps and the lawyer says, we're going to appeal the conviction. Right. Because almost everything that you would appeal, you got to go through the process first. Exactly. You could then say you could then go and say, actually, that search warrant was, you know, uh, unconstitutionally granted. And all of that evidence has to be thrown out. And there's a mistrial or something like that. Right. But normally you don't get to do it ahead of time. This is a special category. And that that appeal, brief, that brief is saying, no, it doesn't really apply here. Right. So uh, it, it could be a really interesting twist here. It could be oral argument or next Tuesday, I believe, yep. the 9th. So uh, the court, of course, has asked the lawyers to focus on it. We haven't seen the counter argument to it yet. So, of course, Trump's lawyers will focus on it at oral argument. We'll hear what they have to say. The circuit court judges will push back. Yeah. I'm sure there will be lively debate and discussion. And who knows? Maybe, maybe they will issue an order on on this ground and that could be the end of it that that, that would basically been saying sorry you can't actually do this appeal now we're not we actually deciding on whether this we don't have jurisdiction what, what are you looking for in, in 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 the sort of arguments next week well, you know, if it's a hot bench, which means a bench that's asking a lot of questions, which I expect it will be, it's to get insight into the panel. 
What are they focused on? What questions are they asking? What are they really pushing the lawyers on? That's the best way we can kind of look through the leaves to see what's, what the thoughts are. And I also suspect we're going to get a quick opinion. Yeah. I mean, this, this may not seem fast to folks watching at home, but for the lawyers, this is moving at lightning speed. So I, I suspect these judges already have a, a sense of where they're going on this. Yes. And I suspect they're already drafting an opinion as is, and yeah. we'll get that pretty quickly. Jimmy Dial, Gonga Williams, Tanya Perry, thank you both. Still ahead, despite her objectionable politics, history in the Trump administration, and misrepresentations of American history, the liberal case for voting Nikki Haley. Next. We are now actually in the election year, with less than two weeks from the first votes being cast in Iowa, followed closely by New Hampshire. I gotta say, it feels kind of sleepier than I thought it would have thought a year ago with the possibility of a real competitive primary. But as candidates realized they had little to no path to the nomination, they began dropping out. Now it seems like the only plausible competitor threatening Donald Trump's path is Nikki Haley. National polls taken over the new year show Trump maintained a roughly 50-point lead over his nearest rival, which again is not great or competitive at all, really, with Haley and Ron DeSantis alternating in that second-place spot. While polls out of Iowa also show Trump with a large lead in New Hampshire, it is a different story. Haley is polling within 14 points of Trump as that primary approaches. Now, it may seem like Democrats don't really have an interest in how the Republican primary shakes out. They likely do not care for any of the candidates. But Brian Boitler makes a pretty persuasive argument that liberals in open primary states should vote for Nikki Haley. Joining me now is a guy who knows all about winning elections, David Pluff, former campaign manager for Barack Obama's 2008 presidential campaign and senior advisor to President Obama. Um, David, I, I, I like to read uh, Brian's uh, uh, substack or, or, or um, email list uh, off message. And I thought the argument basically was, look, it really does matter stopping Trump. If you're in a, not, in a state that allows non-aligned folks to vote, you should vote for Nikki Haley. What do you think? Yeah, I think it's probably too distasteful for a lot of people, but for those who would be up for it to, to do something tactically, I don't know if it would stop Trump, but, you know, it could help extend the primary. I mean, if, if Haley somehow can win New Hampshire uh, or at least get it down to a two-person race, uh, you know, uh, I think when you look out in the rest of the states, Trump's clearly a dominant favorite. But in a two-person race, there's a healthy number of Republicans who are open to alternative if she's the only one. So I think for liberals who or Democrats or independents who might not ever support Nikki Haley to be the president, to cast a strategic or tactical vote to me makes a lot of sense. Uh, you know, again, it's a bridge too far probably for some people, but it could make a lot of sense as we get deeper into this. You know, if the cards fall the right way, if somehow she could finish ahead of, you know, uh, DeSantis in Iowa, I think that makes it more likely. Maybe Christie drops out. But you see in New Hampshire, you know, uh, Trump may be close to his ceiling in New Hampshire. So if you got that to a two-person race, he could very well be defeated there. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing I keep going, I sort of oscillate between these two polls as I think about this, and now we're here in the election year, right? We're here. It's a few weeks away. Is One is that if you look at all traditional metrics and data, Trump is just an overwhelming favorite. There's no historical precedent for someone with this commanding a lead not getting the nomination. And so there's that, which seems like, yeah, he's coasting. And at the same time, I always keep his eyes on, you know, the future is unwritten. Crazy things happen. God knows what can happen. And I have also seen conventional wisdom, particularly around primaries and caucuses and nominations, collapse very quickly because the voters refuse to go along with what the narrative is or even what the early state polling is. Pretty much every recent election. I mean, look at the last one. You know, there was 48 to 72 hours where it looked like Bernie Sanders was absolutely going to be the Democratic nominee and Joe Biden's political career was over. Uh, you know, you look at, uh, you know, our race in 08. You know, we weren't trailing by 40 or 50 points, but we were trailing in national polls by 30 points heading these early contests. When McCain upset George Bush in New Hampshire, I think a lot of people thought, OK, that could be it. So uh, it, it would be highly unusual that there's no surprises in this primary. Maybe there won't be, but historically there generally is. And again, I think the question is, New Hampshire seems to be the place that's set up perhaps for Trump to stumble. And then, you know, if everybody gets out, and that's tough. You know, Ron DeSantis does not want Donald Trump to be the nominee, but he probably, even more than that, doesn't want Nikki Haley right, to be the nominee. Right, that's exactly. <laughs> <laughs> 
I had that same thought today. I had that same thought today because that's that's one thing they can't abide. Well, that's exactly right because it's it would be such an admission of just one of the. I think you know we'll see what happens, but so far one of the worst campaigns I've seen in a while. I mean, when you look at like what they had to work with again the candidate being a major problem there, but but the amount of money they had to work with, the polling they had to work with, the national platform they had to work with, the national name recognition, which again, that's not a given for the, you know, as you know well, right? Like that 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 itself, you got to earn that. They had a lot to work with and they have just utterly squandered it. Absolutely. But the way to think about this thing, back to your question. So this may not happen. I think Trump would like to wrap this up so he, by the end of uh, really January or early February, can move completely on to the general election. But it would be very advantageous for Joe Biden if Trump has to fend off a Nikki Haley, you know, into March, into April. Uh, having been through a reelection campaign in 12, you know, that that gift of time you know, we used it well. I think George Bush used it well against Kerry. Hmm. Uh, Clinton certainly used it well against Dole. But if basically Biden and Trump are starting their general elections at the exact same time, which is what will happen if Trump sails through this primary season, it doesn't mean Biden won't win, but it certainly uh, is disadvantageous. Why? What, why does that matter? Well, because Trump has to still be going to primary states, not battleground states. You know, he may be losing from time to time, makes him look weak. The Biden campaign can spend all of their time on the seven states that determine the presidency. So that's really, I think, and all the messaging, all of it is about the contrast that you need to drive against Trump. It's so crazy. You've said this before when you say the seven states that will determine. I mean, we talk about the seven states and the the voters inside those seven states. We're talking about a nation that's got 340 million people in it. It's got 110 to 120 million people who probably vote in the presidential election. And it's going to be like 100,000 voters (laughs) that are going to determine this. Well, Maybe. it's a little more than that. If you think about the actual swing voters and then you think people who might vote third party and then you think about people who might not vote. So they're a turnout target. You're at most across those states talking at probably two million. So that's the election. It's basically a small governor's race. It's spread across time zones. But that's what it is. And when you think about it that way, wow. it becomes much more manageable organizational. David Pluff, as always, illuminating. Thank you. That does it for All In. You can catch us every weeknight at 8 o'clock on MSNBC. Don't forget to like us on Facebook. That's facebook.com slash All In With Chris.